Hi everyone and welcome back. This is Professor Hall and this is our second in a two-part series on visual rhetoric. So the first part of the series we didn't actually get into talking about rhetoric. I just sort of talked about some general elements of design including things like contrast, color, um, white space, types of fonts, that kind of thing. Um, in this presentation, we're going to get into the actual rhetoric part. So as you can see from my little picture here, um, emotion, pathos, logic, logos, and trust, ethos. Those are the three pillars of rhetoric, of argument, or of persuasion. Some other words that uh, are similar to rhetoric. And we're going to talk about how each one of those plays a part when you are creating um, something with visuals, whether that be a report, a presentation, um, a website, whatever the case may be. So I'm going to talk about each one of those pillars first, and then we're also going to discuss um, informing versus persuading and how your visuals can play a role. So let's get started. All right, so as I said, the three pillars of persuasion, ethos, logos, and pathos. As you can see from this little diagram here, um, they have some overlap in some places. But essentially, if you've taken um, College Composition 1 or College Composition 2 with me um, or with some other instructors, they probably talked about these three pillars of argument. Ethos has to do with, this is the same word we get ethics from, ethics, that Greek root word right there. Logos has to do um, with logic, that same thing. And then pathos has to do with emotion. This is the same um, root word for things like sympathy, sympath. Sympathy, um, sympathy, empathy, and passion actually all come from that same word. So when we are persuading people, the idea really is that we should be relying on a combination of all three of these pillars for the greatest impact. And if you have an argument that relies too much on ethos, then it gets into a lot of character bashing. You might have seen that like in political um, cycles. If you rely too much on pathos, you fall into problems with logical fallacies, meaning there's flaws in your logic because you're just relying on emotion. And if you're relying just on logic, you're going to hit people's brains, but not their hearts. And it's eventually, you know, it's people's hearts that make a decision. Um, that part that is emotional, not as much um, that part that's driven by logic, even though we'd like to think that that's how we make decisions. A lot of times that's not how we make decisions. So with these pillars of persuasion, ethos, same thing, um, as I said, comes from or is that same word in ethics. These are arguments based on a person's character. So my argument about drug use should be listened to because I'm a doctor who has re worked in a rehab facility for 10 years. Or the candidate would make a horrible president because he had an affair. Those are arguments based on a person's character. There are some subtle ways to use ethos in persuasion that are a little bit less direct than this. So things like um, this study came out of Johns Hopkins in 2017. It was done by the president of the foundation and his research team. They have over 20 years of experience, right? That kind of thing with listing credentials, where a study was done, the year it was done, um, the fact, the number numbers of years of experience that people have, the education that they have, all of that goes to ethos. You're showing that they have character. So it, it can be direct or it can be indirect. If you're doing technical and professional writing, ethos is extremely important because many times 
If you get into something like copywriting or technical writing, you're going to be working with your company's brand, right? So brand loyalty is a part of ethos as well. And especially for the generations right now, um, a little bit with Gen X, but particularly millennials, Generation Y, and then Generation Z, um, the older part of Generation Z. Some people in Gen Z are five right now. Um, but for millennials and people in Gen Z, they really care a lot about ethos. They want to make sure that a company that they're giving their loyalty to has the same ethics that they do. So, um, for example, there was something in the news not that long ago, depending on when you're listening to this lecture, um, about a person who owns Soul Cycle and how he had a fundraiser for the president. Well, a lot of people don't agree with that. Um, they don't support the president and they had subscriptions to Soul Cycle, so they canceled their subscriptions and they're kind of leaving that company, right? That's why ethos matters. Um, same thing with um, Nike had a problem a while back for. Um, with with using slave labor and a lot of people stopped buying their shoes, right? So again, ethos, making sure that your company shows that you have, uh, that your company has a good character, that they can be trusted and that you should buy things from them. Pathos are arguments of emotion, as I said. So for example, um, I'm trying to persuade someone here, people in Haiti are still suffering from the effects of an earthquake, give them money to ease their pain. So here I'm working on people's sense of sympathy, um, the fact that they feel bad for the people in Haiti, convincing them that they should give money. Logos, these are arguments based on logic. 80% of people need this product, so chances are you need it too, right? That's a logical jump now there. That might not exactly be logical, but it's playing into logic, or at least it seems logical if you were to see that in an advertisement. And again, like with ethos, um, pathos and logos don't need to be quite this direct. Logos does not always need to be a fact or a statistic. It can be something um, a little bit more subtle. Same thing with pathos. And when we're talking about visuals, these become quite important. Um, does my visual stir up an emotion? Do I have a graph that seems logical and can be logically followed from point A to point B to prove whatever statistic I'm showing? So when you're doing this type of writing, um, if you're doing persuasive writing or persuasive presentation or you're creating marketing or writing copy for ads, um, the first thing is the message. The message is basically your argument. So my argument is my message. Then we've talked a lot about audience. Um, I want to write to my audience. So I have a message. I'm trying to convey that to a specific group of people. Reception. I want my audience to think or do. This is the part that's a little bit different than just something that's purely informative. When you have something that's informative, you still have a message, right? But it really is more content than message. So you have content, you have your audience, and you want them when receiving it to, to understand, right? When you have persuasion, you want to have your audience think, do, or believe something. So you're either trying to change their mind about something, you're trying to persuade them to believe what you believe on a certain topic, or you're trying to kick them into action to persuade them to do something. And tone is part of that. That's your attitude, emotions, and um, feelings on the subject. So your attitude and your feelings about the subject are going to determine your tone. And you can see how all three, or I'm sorry, all four of these um, are interconnected. Um, if you want your audience to think, do, or believe something, but your tone is off, then it's going to hurt their reception, right? So then maybe you have to change your message, or maybe you keep your tone, but you change your audience. So here is how that plays out visually with propaganda. 
I love this ad so much. So much, you guys. You have no idea. I wish this was in person so we could actually have a discussion about this ad. Um, this piece of propaganda is from the 1940s, if you couldn't tell by the looks of the woman. She may look clean, but... Pickups, good time girls, prostitutes, spread syphilis and gonorrhea, and then this. You can't beat the axis if you get VD. So this is um, a piece of propaganda. Propaganda is just a government advertisement. I think we think of propaganda in a different way, but it's the government trying to convince you to do, think, or believe something. Visually, um, this is playing on emotion. So it might be logical, yes, that um, if you pick people up and you get a prostitute, especially um, in this time period um, when a lot of that was going on among people in the military, you can see we've got uh, possibly a businessman there and someone from the Army and then somebody from the Navy, right? That might even be Army, Air Force, and Navy. I can't really tell from their outfits. It's small. But um, visually, we talked about white space before. We have white space here that's drawing you both to her face and then to this red word, but. We talked about um, things like uh, size of a font or color um, or the weight, right? Whether it's bold or heavier type of font. Um, here, the, the words are the same size, but the word but is in red. And also, um, when we have things on an angle like this, it makes you feel slightly uncomfortable. Your eyes drawn to it more naturally because it's on that 45 or maybe a little bit less than 45 degree angle because so much of our world is made up of 90 degree angles. So we're very used to that. So if you see a movie like I just got out of, a, I went to a horror movie earlier today before recording this, um, whenever something scary was coming up or something was supposed to be creepy, the camera would take a strange offset angle. It's sort of saying to you that the world's not right. Um, you can't beat the axis if you get VD. The problem here is that it's not really high contrast enough. Um, it may have been in its original version, though. And um, so it's playing on fear. It's making you feel uncomfortable by having that um, those words at the angle. And then at the same time, um, giving you a picture of a very wholesome looking woman, right? So which contrasts the idea of syphilis and gonorrhea. So it's interesting to me that they kind of make you feel safe with her face. It looks very much like other advertisements of the time period, and then they kind of hit you. So it's a, an emotional kind of one-two punch. And then that line at the bottom, you can't beat the axis if you get VD. Now this is trying to play onto people's patriotism. So if you're a good soldier, if you're a good American, you want to beat the axis, then don't sleep around. That's basically what it's telling you. And um, it's so it's it's a it's a three part emotional punch. And it's somewhat logical at the same time the, the you can't beat the axis part. You know, it, it is patriotism and it also plays into ethos. The character. Do you have a good character? Can you stay away from that while we're at war? Here's another piece of propaganda. I want to be clear that this is from I think this is from Great Britain. I was going to say Canada, but now I realize not. If you look there, that's Great Britain. Um, snowflakes, your army needs you and your compassion. Me, 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 millennials, your army needs you and your self-belief. Selfie addicts, your army needs you and your confidence. Um, this is an interesting little piece of propaganda. Um Really stark black and white pictures of younger people in uniform, right? Again, that that use of white spaces there in each picture, drawing your eye directly to their face. There we go. A little bit sharper so you can kind of see that, right? Drawing your eye directly to their face. Um, the kind of, you know, depending on how you take it, 
mildly offensive to people in that generation, calling them snowflakes, me, 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 millennials, and selfie addicts. Um, the red contrasting the black and white. And then your army needs you and your compassion, self-belief, confidence. So the idea here is to grab your attention by saying something that is basically putting down an entire generation, which most people I know who are in that generation are not like that at all. I think that's a stereotype that um, is ridiculous. Um, but at any rate, um, it's trying to get your attention by using that stereotype, right? And then flipping that on its head. So if you were offended at being called a snowflake or if you're rolling your eyes, then we say, oh, you want people who are compassionate. Oh, it's I'm me, me, me. I, I really, they're right. I'm not selfish. I have self-belief. Um, selfie addicts. It's not that I'm just addicted to my phone. I actually have confidence. So it's sort of trying to say um, in one swoop, uh, first to mildly offend you and then to build up your self-esteem a little bit. That's the emotional part, okay? The ethical part is that it's saying the top is how other people see you. Your snowflakes, your me, 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 your selfie addicts, right? The bottom part is how the army sees you. We see you as you're compassionate. We see you as having self-belief. We see you as having confidence. So in one swoop, it makes the army look, I think this is the intention. I don't know if they pull it off, but the intention is for the army to look more ethical because they see beyond the label, right? And it also makes the people, uh, the target audience feel like they have a better character than is what is typically portrayed in the media, right? I'm not a snowflake. I have compassion. I don't just take selfies all the time. I actually have self-confidence. So that's sort of the intention. I don't know how successful that is. And I think that this is the, an ad that is made probably in a, in a room full of people in their 40s and 50s trying to figure out how to recruit people in their teens and 20s and coming up with what they think people that age would want to see. I don't know if it works, but that's the intention at any rate. Okay, so this is a different type of propaganda. This one is from the Office of the National um, Drug Policy. I can't read that that second, the third word there. Um, and I wanted to, well, I'll talk about this first. Here's the thing. The, the image is more important than the text, Okay, in, in some ways, I'm going to switch over to white here because I think it'll show better. So here is the image, the white space around the image. And then we have a little bit of white space here and we have a little bit of white space here and at the top. Right. Um, I think the problem with this is that there's not enough white space. We have in larger, heavier letters. It's a fine line between respecting your teen's privacy and doing your job as a parent. And then the words drugs, drinking, tobacco, sex, and then parents, the anti-drug. It really depends where this ad was placed. I think this was something that sometimes was in like bus stations and stuff um, and possibly in magazines. The rest of the text is important but it's too small. So the question here is, what do they actually want people to see? Because if they just want to hit you quickly, um, respecting your teen's privacy, do your job as a parent, think about drugs, drinking, tobacco, sex, parents, they're the anti-drug. Okay, that's basically the message. Do I need to read the rest of it? I don't know. Um, I think that if you are a parent, maybe you would read it. I also think that if they had taken this image, kept the white space, shrunk it down and made it maybe to here, it still would have been as interesting. And then we could have had larger text like that that could have been more visible. There's also in the bottom part there, um, in very tiny things, there's a bunch of... Um, 
Leadership to Keep Children Alcohol Free, National African American Tobacco Network. There, there's a bunch of things listed, but there's there's a very, very small number right at the bottom for parents to call if they're actually needing help. So to me, uh, you know, rename this, have the, the phone number maybe up here where it's a lot bigger because we're missing that important information. Now, on the other hand, this um, particular piece of propaganda. This is for victim compensation. Um, and it's talking about if you are a victim of domestic violence, right? So vi or, or any type of um, violence in, in California. Um, we have the images here. They're very impactful. Why? Well, a couple things. Number one, you'll notice we've got something on an angle. It draws our eye both up here and then also down here to the Spanish, right? Second thing, um, this person here, we can't really tell what gender or ethnicity they are. Then here we've got people of different genders, ethnicities, and ages. So it really hits a wide range for the audience in one fell swoop just with that visual. It's saying, look, if you're a man, if you're a woman, if you're a child, if you're an elderly person, um, whatever the case may be, violent, violence hurts everyone, we can help. Same thing here in Spanish. And then we've got the info both in Spanish and in English as well. And then very clearly, small and I probably would have made it bigger, um, but not quite as small as the one over on the left. Um, small is the info to contact them. So even if somebody were in that situation, they could take a quick picture of this poster, get the number, get the website, and then go and find out later, right? Um, but both of these have images that are hitting those pillars of rhetoric. They are... Um, possibly if you are not in a situation where you have experienced violence, then you're feeling sympathy and you want to know maybe what you can do to help as well, right? Um, if you are the parent of a teen um, over there on the left, you can maybe relate to the parent who has their head in their hands and just is looking directly at camera. Um, both of these, you know, you don't see this in movies. People don't look directly at camera, but we've got an eye line here that's looking directly at us and an eye line over here that's looking directly at us. Same thing here where they're kind of, it's in shadow, but same thing. Um, just kidding. Um, but at any rate, that direct look into camera tries to draw you in emotionally. And that's really what these advertisements are about. Visually, they're persuading you um, based on emotion. So <laughs> with this advertisement, something totally different, um, what type of rhetoric is this using? How is this trying to persuade people to buy the product? First, what's the ad selling? Well, unlike some ads, uh, Pepsi understands branding and they put their brand right here. This is something from a few years ago, and I'm not sure if they even have this anymore. I don't drink pop or soda, so um, I'm not sure. But branding is right there, right? So we know what it's selling. I think I took the other pictures out. There's some later on where I'm like, I don't know what this is selling. <laughs> Who is the audience? Um, you know, an adult might look at that and kind of be like, huh, that's clever. Or an adult might look at that and be like, oh, that's gross. Why? I don't like that. Why would you have that lime looking like it's peeing into a Pepsi? Um, but really... Who's going to think that this is funny? Probably a younger audience, right? I, I think uh, my brother, when he was 12 um, or 13, would have thought that that was hilarious. Um, would have probably worn on a t-shirt, if that is the case. And that humor is an emotion. So it is trying to appeal to people's sense of humor. Is the advertiser making convincing arguments? So it sort of depends. The target audience, you know, if you look at the target audiences like somebody who is 45 and quite serious, they're probably not going to 
like that ad, right? Um, Pepsi is a difficult thing because they've built up brand loyalty, meaning that people will people know what a Pepsi is and they'll drink it. They don't necessarily need to see advertising for it. They use advertising to keep themselves at the top, um, but for the most part, um, are you looking at other people who drink Pepsi? Probably, right? That's sort of their target audience. So people who drink Pepsi, they want them to buy new products. They want them to buy more products. This ad is aiming at people who drink Pepsi who are probably younger, um, maybe between the ages of like 12 and 17, right? Somewhere in there. And would those people buy the product? Maybe based on this ad, I, you know, I don't know. It, it's tough, but at least it would make people laugh and it might make them more aware that Pepsi Twist is out there. They might not go out and buy one based on this ad, but they would at least be like, huh, okay. And then next time they see it in the store, oh yeah, I forgot. Yeah, I heard about that, you know, because they're, they're laughing and it's taking them out of themselves. All right, this one non-smoking area 31st of may is world tobacco world no tobacco day so what is this ad selling it is trying to get people not to smoke um this is not from uh it's not from a jewel or any <laughs> anything like that but the primary audience um I would guess that this one is for maybe an older audience, a younger audience, people who are maybe, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16, they might not really get, you know, the, the full impact of the cemetery, even though here they might know what the cemetery is, um, they might not get the full impact. What emotion is it trying to appeal to? So the last one was trying to appeal to humor. Um, this one is trying to make people feel afraid. They have this big area here of white space, and then they put the words right in the center. So that is what our eye is drawn to. Um, it's trying to make people feel afraid. It's trying to be a little bit ironic, so possibly maybe dark humor, but I think it, you know, it depends on the age of the person and their experience. If you have had a parent or a loved one die from cancer who smoked, you are going to be horrified at this advertisement. If you don't smoke yourself, and um, you see this and you see non-smoking area, you might be like, huh, yeah, that's funny. Um, I can tell you this, I think it's it's targeted toward a little bit older crowd as well because we don't really have smoking and non-smoking areas anymore, right? Um, in restaurants or in bars, usually a restaurant, well, restaurants in New York don't have smoking. And then usually buildings are non-smoke, like our campus is a, is a smoke-free campus and people have to go outside it. So it's not like it was in the 1980s where you'd go into a restaurant and there would be a smoking section and a non-smoking section. So would the target audience be convinced? I, I don't know if you're going to have someone who is a smoker look at this and be convinced. It might hit them and it might not. It's kind of a risky ad, but visually um, drawing our eye, it makes such a difference when I take that off of there, right? Uh, visually drawing our eye to this non-smoking area and then we're searching for more text in your brain and then you come down here to World No Tobacco Day. I think it would have been more effective if there was a link there for people to get information on how to stop smoking. I think just having World No Tobacco Day is not really a convincing thing to do. So if you're trying to get people to stop, providing them a resource to help stop would be more convincing. Here, to me, this is hitting people who are already non-smokers. Emotionally, you're, you're not going to get that full impact, I don't think. But it is an emotional ad. And it, it does at least make you stop and think. You can't eat sympathy. World, ending world hunger ends here. All right, so what is this ad selling? This is 
uh, not exactly selling anything, but it's trying to get you to go to the Action Center for Mercy Corps. I'm going to zoom in on the visual of the guy. Um, so he's got black body paint um, to make him a little bit more thin. This is an interesting use of contrast because we have black on black, and so it kind of blends in, right? So if you're taking a look... Um, quickly flipping through a magazine, you do stop because it looks like his body um, is like that, right? And they've tried to make him even look a little bit more bony than he already is, especially with the knees right here, right? So our eye kind of might be stopped by him. It's definitely drawn to these very large letters, the white on the black, high contrast. We have one color here um, as a pop of color um, with that lime green, um, or kind of in between a lime and an olive. But at any rate, who is the audience? Possibly, you know, when you have some a person in the ad, they might be trying to hit people in their 20s. It's trying to appeal to your sense of sympathy, but then it's going beyond that. Don't just feel bad for people who are hungry. Sign up to actually do something. Take action. Join the Action Center. Go to our website. And unlike the other things we've seen, little bit of text, visual that's small enough that grabs our attention, and then contact information. Their website is large. So the other ones just were driving me crazy, you guys, because they want people to contact them, and then they put their numbers so small. And if you are ever doing copy or you're editing for these kind of things, Make sure that the contact information is large and visible and able to be seen. It's just good design, um, especially when you're trying to get people to go there. So is it a convincing argument? I, you know, I don't know. It would depend. Based on this ad with the target audience signed up, I think you would have some people sign up. I can tell you this. Even if people didn't sign up, a lot more people would at least go to the website to find out more, right? Whereas with this ad, there's no place for them to go. There's nothing for them to find out um, in further information. Um, here you don't have an ad. I was going to flip back to the things about um, the violence and, and, uh, and the parent action for the anti-drug. So what is this ad selling? Um, did you realize that it was an ad when I first clicked on it? It's an Instagram um, post. A couple things here. I'm going to switch back to my red pen. The reason that I'm including this in particular um, is not because I want to be like, Instagram is full of ads. Watch out. Um, it is. And and we should at least be, I think we should be more aware of what when we're seeing things that are ads. So Tom's has this thing right here that says sponsored. Um, they are required to do that now. They were not before. And sometimes people still do don't do that if it's an ad for something that they themselves have created. It's not sponsored by anyone else necessarily. Autumn is here and we have the perfect shoes. We're giving away a chance to win. So this, our eye is drawn to this word giveaway. And what are they selling? Well, as with most of Instagram, the emotion it's trying to appeal to is aspiration. This is an aspirational ad, meaning that the audience wants to be, um, possibly wants to be like the people that it sees in the ad. I want to sit out on a cool day in my fancy clothes and just drink a cup of coffee. Um, I want to visit interesting places. They've got a really unique use of color here. We've got blue, we've got blue, we've got blue, we've got blue, and then we have red kind of here in the middle um, and some reddish kind of tones in the background. Um, I'm going to erase that. There we go. So here's the trick. They're not asking their audience to buy something. This is what's called a soft sell. So the persuasion here is they don't want you to buy 
They're not persuading you to buy directly. What they're trying to persuade people to do is to sign up for their email. The chance of getting something free. Free is the key right now to selling things. You have to give something away. If you're not giving something away for free at some point in that funnel, that marketing funnel process, um, the funnel starts with uh, gaining interest and leads down to buying the product. That's the old funnel. The new funnel is um, building customer loyalty so that they then become aware of your new products. Um, they become interested, they do more research or they search for it, they buy more and they build up more brand loyalty. That's kind of the new funnel. So visually here, we have um, a dominant image, three smaller images. The white space is in the picture because you're not <laughs> heads up they want to do updates um every time i get in here it tries to update me sorry about that guys um so the white space is kind of up here right and we kind of look directly at giveaway first putting white on the image to give it that negative space only in the words our eye might travel down here and then it comes back up here to actually read and then to click for more information. This might actually be a Facebook ad. I can't remember if I took it from Facebook or Instagram. At any rate, they have your name, they have your email, they can set, start sending you targeted ads and more directly sell you their product through email. Um, because you clicked their target feeds, um, they'll target your feed with more sponsored posts of celebrities wearing their products. But in terms of the three pillars, um, logic, oh, I can get something for free. They're giving it away. I might as well sign up. It doesn't hurt anything and it doesn't cost me anything. That's logically what they want you to think. Now, the jump in logic is that they know, and you should too, that this is like gambling. The house always wins. If you sign up, even if you're not going to buy anything that day, you might later on. Um, so that's logically how they're trying to get you to, to look for the free thing that doesn't take you anything more than a couple clicks. Um, emotionally, they're trying to make you feel like you are envious of the people wearing the shoes. That's what aspirational brands do. They build envy or jealousy um, so that you want to be like the people in the picture and you start lusting after their products, right? The third thing is that this is somewhat of a play for ethos as well. We're giving, we have brand new shoes for your trips and getaways and we're giving you a chance to win. We're going to give things away because we're just that nice of a company and you can win things from us and we have a good character, that's what they're selling. So they're using all three of those pillars to sell this. And this is why um, already this was, I think I grabbed this the day it came out, um, uh, over a thousand comments and it hasn't even been a day. All right. It was a Facebook ad on the other one. Okay. So Joe and DeCamp or Joe and Kemp, I'm not sure which one it is. Um, what is this selling? Joanne Kemp, always snacking in at Aeropostale denim, hashtag pizza, hashtag Aeropostale, hashtag best denim ever, hashtag ad. Okay, um, and then all of the comments. That's all she needs to put to show you that this is an ad. She's selling the jeans, but she's also selling the pizza because people ask later on, um, yeah, but the pizza is here. Um, love how you style your hair. And then pizza looks great. Where did you get it? So um, she's also got some kind of logo going on there. And she might also in her comments list where her, oh, she's got another logo on her hat and sunglasses and she is very clearly trying to show you the logo on her shoe too if you think she's standing that way just to be cute she's not she's trying to show you the logo on her shoe so 
when people comment, um, she will tell them, oh, here's where I got the hat. I think the hat looks like Tommy Hilfiger. I'm not sure who the Hello Love is from. Not sure where she got the necklace or the sunglasses, but I know for sure that it's denim is from Arrow Postel. She is a brand ambassador, which is a fancy word for being a model and an advertiser. And that's okay. It's okay that she's doing that. You know, I'm not I'm not saying that there's a judgment here and I don't hate Instagram. I have an Instagram uh, at Megan Steve 5050 if you want to check out my publishing company. Um, but what's the ad selling? It's selling a lot of stuff. The most important thing it's selling is right here at the top. Right? So secondarily, she's selling Aeropostale, Tommy Hilfiger, and... Um, I think those are starters, the shoes. I forget the brand name of the shoes, right? That's what she's selling secondarily. She's a brand ambassador or a model for Aeropostale. What she's mostly selling is herself. The more people sign up for her account to follow her, the more deals she gets with other brands and the more money she makes. And that's the interesting thing to me is that years ago, some, I mean, models would get a lot of money, but they're still representing those brands. For the most part now, people who are so-called brand ambassadors are really representing themselves. And what they're building on is social capital. They, you know, sure, the pizza is good. I forgot to circle the pizza. Um, she did later in the comments say where it was. Um, but really she's trying to build up um, brand loyalty for herself and how she's doing that again is envy and aspiration oh my gosh you're so cute i'm passionate about fashion check my pics too you're beautiful your hair is so cute where did you get it cut um people the idea is for you to want to be like her right so based on the ad would the advertiser make a convincing argument would people buy Aeropostale jeans based on this picture? Maybe not. But Joanne doesn't care about that. She wants you to follow her. So you share, you comment, and more people see it, and they comment, and they follow her, and then she gets more advertising deals. And that's basically the idea. And... Um, it's a really good use of visual rhetoric because it's a lot of persuasion going on all at the same time. If you shop like me, you can be like me. You can have fun in New York City or in L.A., whichever town she's in, um, and you can grab a piece of pizza and you can just have fun and you can be cute and adorable, right? That's that's the envy there. That's what they're. That's what she's trying to do. And the orange is brilliant, too, because your eye travels to that color. So if you're flipping through your feed, um, big chunks of orange grab your attention. It's really smart. I don't know who this girl is, and I don't follow her, but it's really smart. So when trying to persuade, oh, my Carefully consider your audience and what pictures would best tap into the logic, emotion, and sense of ethics. You know, the last one, do we have uh, a sense of ethics? Not necessarily, but Aero Pastel is trying to, to use brand ambassadors who are a certain age, a certain gender, have a certain look, have a certain lifestyle, right? That's the character that they're showing to appeal to that younger demographic. Um, there's no logic in this that particular picture, but there might be in other ones. Um, so, for example, on the right here, <laughs> one of, this is uh, Kylie Jenner. Um, in a swimsuit for her swimsuit line. Again, that is what the Jenners and the Kardashians are built upon, aspiration, making you envy them and hate them, but also sort of want to be them or be like them at the same time. So a 65-year-old retired woman who likes to read and knit is not going to care about this cutout bathing suit, right? And she's probably might say, oh, <laughs> I know because I heard a 65 year old retired woman say this and I said, you know, because for this presentation, I said, um, what would you say about this picture? And she said, everybody always wants to buy a boat. But really, boats are just a lot of work and a lot of cleaning and they cost more than they're worth. 
Okay. <laughs> a totally different reaction. And ignored the bathing suit altogether. Um, but a totally different reaction um, than maybe a 25-year-old male looking at this who's just like, she's hot. Um, or a girl looking at this who's like, oh, I wish I had that body, right? That is that aspiration. So it's selling a brand and a specific image of a certain lifestyle to a very specific demographic. And here, unlike when we're just doing writing, the visual is speaking for you. So it has, that's the tone, right? The tone here is kind of sexy, sultry. The tone in the last one is cute, adorable, flirty, fun. Okay, the tone in this one is uh, not as much because we don't see faces, but it seems a little bit kind of like calm and cool. That's the tone from those pictures. So it's a very specific demographic. So when you're picking images, I know I've been talking a lot about advertising here, but the same is true for when you're choosing images for a website, a presentation, or uh, if you have a report that has images in it as well. Consider especially the emotions that they bring out in your audience because graphs and charts are going to hit those pieces of logic. Um, the things that you're saying might hit the ethos a little bit, but really a lot of times the visuals go straight for um, pathos, straight for emotions. Do you want your audience to feel happy, anxious, hopeful? Decide that and think about that. What emotion is going to drive them the most? If you're trying to convince people to quit smoking, are you going to get them with humor? Are you going to get them with black humor like maybe that ad was going for? Are you going to get them with fear? Um, are you going to get them with logic? Usually not for smoking. For smoking, people know that it is not healthy for them and then they do it anyway, right? And they'll, they'll say, oh, I'm hooked and blah, blah, blah. So can you hit somebody with the logic of how much money it costs every week if they're smoking? Possibly to go at it from a different angle. But that's one of the reasons that a lot of those ads uh, that you might see on TV or even on streaming services, like on YouTube and stuff like that, they'll show them sometimes before videos of non-smoking. Um, you know, they'll have someone who was devastated by cancer or someone who is um, had their throat replaced. Um tapping into the fear, disgust, um, and, and possibly anger, trying to get people to change. So think about the emotions you want to bring up, and the emotion is going to determine what type of image you use. That's really the key. So here, I'm not going to read this for you, but this is History of the Circus. Um, we have a bright teal kind of blue color there. For the headline, um, it matches with the blue here. It's a little bit lighter than the blue on the elephant. The elephant looks happy. The woman is happy. Um, she's sitting in the elephant's thing. This guy looks bored. But we don't see him maybe quite as much as the other people. Um, this is from greatest Barnum and Bailey's and the Ringling Brothers greatest show on earth and there's some informative um, text there the circus is a company of performers the term circus describes although the inventor of the medium is Philip Astley although not the inventor of the medium Philip Astley is credited as the father of the modern circus but it's bright and it's happy and it's fun and this we've got the white space right like I talked about around the picture and around the heading and around the edges. The other thing here that I didn't talk as much about last time is light. And the light here is concentrated on this woman and the elephant's trunk, right? Probably because it has a spotlight. So then we get darker over here. This is completely black and this is kind of in shadow. And we've got a little bit of light down here, but not really as much. Your eye is really drawn right to this kind of bullet point center. And the interesting thing about that is that it sort of creates a white space. So the black kind of blends in and gives you even more um, of a visual break. But consider this, which is the same information, um, but done in a visually different way. 
History of the Circus. Okay. Circus is a company of performers. The term circus describes, although not the inventor of the medium, it is the exact same text. What is the difference? Well, the first thing is that we have a totally different font. This is Impact, and it's in black rather than that fun blue. There's no exclamation point. That's the only difference here. And then we have this visual. And this is a visual of an elephant um, either going to the circus or them being captured in the wild to go to the circus. It looks pained. Its eyes are closed. We've got the chains. And where does the light go? Well, there's darkness here. This is kind of a little bit darker over here, but really our eye is drawn right, right here, right? So the first one, um, happy, fun, excited about the circus and the elephants at the circus. And the second one, feeling bad for the elephants, bringing out those emotions of pain, regret, sorrow, sympathy, disgust. Um, and the, the visual totally different. So if you have something that's supposed to just be informative, you have to be very careful. And particularly, you know, if you were used doing the history of the circus, I'm likely I wouldn't use either of these images. I would probably use something a little bit more emotionally neutral that maybe was from a long time ago um, that showed the actual history there. Here's another example, healthcare compensation. Um, and we've got information um, just about hospitals and non pediatric hospitals, what surgeons earn, what nurses earn, what nurse practitioners earn. Um, but our visual is healthcare. And it makes me think, and this is actually um, adapted from an article that I saw recently. I had I, I was looking at an article that was about healthcare compensation and it had a visual like this and I thought it was like how much healthcare costs and how a lot of people are in medical debt, right? That's what that picture makes me think. Um, here's a totally same exact information. I changed the headline from red to blue to match her outfit there, uh, her scrubs. Now we've got healthcare compensation and it's a nurse with a patient. So the first one makes me feel worried and anxious maybe about the cost of healthcare, how many how much people are getting paid, how that might affect me, how it might affect me if I don't have insurance for a month or if I do what my copays are going to be, right? That's that emotion um, with the visual. The visual rhetoric t changes completely when you put in this very kind looking nurse. Um, she actually looks a little bit pained on her face like she's faking a smile, but that's probably just because she's a model, not an actual nurse. <laughs> um, my point is, though, and it's also a little bit pixelated, something else to look for, but my point is that it brings out feelings of comfort, right? Healthcare compensation. Oh, okay, maybe I could be a registered nurse. They make an average of 68000 a year. Nurse practitioners can earn 95000 on average, right? I could be like this and I could be helping people. So it's interesting to me that this change makes me feel less anxious, makes me feel more comfortable, and also plays upon ethos if you're thinking about being a nurse or going to healthcare. And it's saying that Yes, they get paid, but they get paid well because they care and they're helping you. That's the message there. And the message there is done just with a visual. You're not going to read that anywhere, right? It's all in the subtext. So when trying to inform, I'm going to talk more about this. Um, I'm actually going to break this presentation up in half. We're going to talk about the information in a moment. I was going to have this be two parts, but we're running a little bit long here. I talked for too long with the ads. So um, I'll break it up here and you can watch part three as soon as you want. Thanks.